Monterey Faro, like many um, bands and other activities, came out of a couple people that met in art school. Myself, Yvonne here, and our friend Danny. We had all studied photography. So um, I think there was an interest in resources. Um, we were, like many others before us, feeling kind of disenfranchised. And um, so it started as this really sort of artist-centered activity and has just continued to grow and get bigger and bigger. The story of Gallery of Ferro. I always tell the story of Gallery of Ferro as um, my friends, uh, Emma and Danny, uh, wanted to take pictures in New Jersey. And I said, where? And they were like, New Jersey. And I said, isn't that across the river somewhere? And they're like, yeah, it's great, man. you got to check out New Jersey. And, uh, you know, and then we got to know New Jersey. I got to know New Jersey. They already knew New Jersey. And uh, we found a space that was beautiful, amazing, uh, and affordable. And we decided Where? to... In Newark. In the Iron? In the Ironbound. Uh, it was a beautiful... A uh, 40,000 square foot classic brick warehouse. I mean, like 360 degree windows. It was really quite fabulous. Um, and we decided to open a space with artist studios and and a, a little gallery. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we got kicked out. In 2006, we got another phone call from someone who remembered us and the work that we had begun to do, the work that we had accomplished, um, and said, there's a free building in Newark. And I, I wasn't sure how I felt about that because we had um, been through so much. And so another question that we get asked a lot is, is this building from the city? Is this, you know, a, a public initiative to support the arts? And I think what's happening in Newark, at least right now, is a lot of, you know, these sort of big machinations are from the private sector. So in 2006, we had the opportunity to reopen here, where we're conducting this interview on Market Street. Um, so we're, you know, in the middle of, we're right in the middle of the sort of core downtown area. And I always remember the night that we opened because I didn't know if anyone would come. And it was, by our standards, now kind of a small crowd. It was probably about 40 or 50 people. But we decided to chop the building roughly in half. And we've, um, we've stayed with that. We're about 50% of the building is for artist studios, and then 50% of the building is for um, presenting space for galleries. And that was based on the idea that 20,000 square feet was, you know, it's too much for any one person's vanity project. That's a lot. So you have to share it. I just, I just want to go back to the, that free building phone call. Yeah. Because there, there, there are a lot of misconceptions about how alternative spaces run and about how nonprofits run and about what is free and what isn't free and how these kinds of things work. And I, I have stopped calling this a free building and I, I have started calling it a rent-free building. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't necessarily pay rent on this building, but occupying this space as a resource for the artists that have studios here and as a resource for the artists that exhibit here is an incredibly expensive endeavor, even without paying rent. Because I think people say, free building? I'll take one of those, you know, which is, which is sort of what we did. We're like, yeah, we'll take one of those. But, you know, um, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of work and planning and resources and fundraising uh, that goes into being able to occupy this space. Uh, talking about this idea of art always um, institutionalizing itself, um, I was thinking a lot about the fact that I've been at this now for more than 10 years. It was late, I was tired, we had had a long day of um, the kind of work that Yvonne's talking about, um, helping people, talking with people, trying to do the work of, of bringing about consensus within different gatherings of people, that kind of labor. There's the labor of paperwork and spreadsheets. There's the labor of, you know, mopping and, and repairing things. There's all this kind of, of labor. And so it was the end of a day like that, and I was thinking, 
would this place um, exist if we stopped for one minute? There's this sort of constant work. Um, it's like the joke about the airplane flying because everyone wills it to do so. You know, you just sort of put your arms out and flap. And um, people have started to refer to us sometimes in a kind of quasi-institutional way. And my self-image is still as someone who's 22 where I'm just sort of uh, blindly figuring things out. And it's, so, it's very surreal to have this idea of, that it, there's some kind of institution um, and then there's this sort of darker side of it. Um, I joke with Yvonne sometimes about, you know, are we becoming the man? You want to you keep an eye on that. Does the, does the, um, do the means become the end? Mm. So I think about that a lot um, because I do think people sometimes get burned out and lose their way. And I always think to myself if there's ever a time when we're not making decisions based on this sort of conception of the sort of young artist self of, you know, it's the, the viewpoint is from someone who does not have a lot of resources, it's not necessarily a very resource-rich perspective. If I ever lose sight of that person in terms of decision making, I've lost my life. Possibly the most flattering thing that I can imagine would be to have a pharaoh turn into a, a noun or a verb in common parlance. <laughs> I'm going to a pharaoh. You know, just to have to have built something, to have drawn it out on a napkin in a diner, and it's now just sort of part of people's lives. That's I don't see us as an institution. I mean, I really <laughs> don't. And, and, and it, to me, in an institution, the directors don't have to clean the toilets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a really basic definition for me. I know that's really taking things to the lowest common denominator, but, you know, I will know that we are an institution when I no longer have to put on the yellow rubber gloves and clean the job. Because we are artists, we know the kind of sort of freedom and support that artists need. So maybe I'm not necessarily like one of the gang, as you say, but I'm also not, you know, the content dictator. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't like that guy. Can and you I know? certainly don't ever want to be him. The 48 hour line? Oh yeah, the 48 hour line was so amazing. So uh, I met a young man uh, in the sculpture department at SVA. After I had left SVA, I was taking a sculpture class there, and I met a young man who was just about to graduate, and he just had this great sort of draw and personality where all of his happenings and events and activities were really these super engaging... What's his name? Um, uh, Ryan Barone. And so we asked him if he would be interested in doing an event with us, and he came up with this really complicated idea for uh, an event that would go on for 48 hours straight and it would be 100% participatory and he called it the 48 hour line. And so he built uh, paper walls, giant paper walls in the front of the gallery and we had the gallery open for 48 hours straight and for 48 hours there was a pencil in motion in some way on the paper mm -hmm. and uh, you know and people would hand off the pencil and take turns and everything like that but it really truly did not stop moving or come off the paper for 48 hours. In my mind as long as we keep experimenting and never let fear rule we'll never be the man. Mm -hmm. and that means a genuine commitment to process mm -hmm. and not just Sort of the process that we show, uh, what Dave Hickey calls the looky loose, but the real thing, not not the sort of heavily edited for public consumption, but process and all of its meanderings and its amazing moments of discovery and its moments of baffled confusion. So I think that seeps over into our programming. It's just we we come out of this this understanding of the world as artists and this kind of deep commitment to process. So that's probably something that's kind of distinctive about us. I don't just want to be the waiting room. So. Sarah has destroyed my own artistic practices. The truth is I've actually stopped encouraging art students to be interns. And I've started because art students who are interested in having a career in the arts don't need to learn how to make spreadsheets for a nonprofit, mm -hmm. right? They need to learn how to budget a program, write a proposal, try to get their projects funded, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't necessarily need to learn 
the ins and outs of running an art gallery day to day and being an administrator. They need career development for artists, not for administrators. And the truth is that, um, you know, we're an artist-run organization, but we have we have gone through a lot of trial and error because we didn't study business. It it is very difficult maintaining an artist's practice and also running any kind of nonprofit or running any kind of business for that matter that that is not your art practice. I don't. Um, I think that if if anyone is considering establishing an alternative space, be forewarned, it is a huge time suck. Mm -hmm. Like a huge, huge time suck. It's not a pet project, and if it is a pet project, it's probably going to fail. Mm. It's, I think a lot of misconception that it's, that it's sort of, it's all in the art world, so it's all the same thing, and it is absolutely not mm. the same thing at all. Developing a career as an artist is not the same as developing a space or a business. I have no idea how this video will be edited down, but <laughs> it's it's important to tell the truth. It really is. I mean, I'm rambling on here about implicit and explicit um, incentives or disincentives um, to talk about certain things, and I, I often feel like there's a rule, and you're not supposed to talk about that. The party line is, oh yes, everything's okay, and it's all very rewarding and, re and enriching. And I would love there to be room in the world for truth-telling about um, the sort of trade-offs and sacrifices and the rewards of doing the kind of work that we do. If I say that it's been a huge challenge to maintain any kind of personal artistic practice, that doesn't um, devalue or in any way um, sort of take away any of the richness and the truthfulness of the fact that doing what I do at a pharaoh is also very rewarding and has enriched my life. But if I'm actually telling the truth, it's a very difficult subject and some of the wonderful mentors and colleagues and friends um, that we've had over the past 10 years, I've watched them negotiate their own sort of public and private personas around this topic. Um, maybe I should just uh, let them know who they are if they see this video. But if you're really going to tell the truth, it's a very difficult topic. Um, sometimes when we're visiting some of our, our mentors at their respective organizations, you might find a photo, it's usually black and white, again, not always, it depends on the, the year of founding might be a Polaroid, you know, I'm talking the 60s and 70s, and it's the founders and their, their younger selves, you know. And I just think a lot about what the work that it's required, the work that it takes to sort of make anything last. Mm -hmm. Artists have families. The, the persistent mythos of the artist is this singular being, I think dates back to the, you know, 1950s. It's the Cedar Bar Bohemian who's a single man. We have families, we have complex entanglements of lovers and children and and all of those things that other people do. So that's this other fiction that we can't seem to quite get rid of. It persists. Every time I think it's finally died, it comes back. This idea of, of artists don't have families.